claim to be born of God, you're defined by two things. One, they believe Jesus is the Christ, okay? And two, they love God the Father's child, a.k.a. his family, also known as our brothers and sisters in Christ, other Christians. So let's start with the first one. All who claim to be born again should be defined by the belief that Jesus is the Christ. New Testament written in what language originally? Good job. I ask it almost every week, and you know it every single week. Christ in Greek, highlighted in red there, is Christos. Okay, that's how you pronounce it. And its definition is anointed one. All right, it means anointed one. Now, in the Bible, three types of people were anointed. Three types of people only. Prophets, priests, and kings. So when we believe that Jesus is not just an appointed one, does it say Jesus a Christ up there? No, it says Jesus the Christ. So when we believe that Jesus is not an appointed one, but the Christ, the appointed one, do we believe that Jesus is the prophet of our life? Do we accept that he alone holds the truth that isn't relative from person to person, but the absolute truth for all? Do we believe that Jesus is the priest of our life? You see, priests in the Bible were ordained to offer sacrifices. So do we accept that Jesus was ordained to offer himself as the sacrifice for all of humankind, not just for those who live and believe and act like us? Do we believe that Jesus is the king of our life? Do we accept and submit to his government, hating what he hates and loving what he loves? And do we, as his loyal subjects, truly desire to see his kingdom come and not just our version of it? If we can answer yes to every single one of those questions, then we do believe that Jesus is the Christ, as those who claim to be born of God should. But remember, as I said a couple minutes ago, that doesn't stop with Jesus. The second thing those who claim to be born of God should be defined by is that they love God the Father's child, which is who? I just told you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, other Christians, right? And notice, you love them, and it, it ends there. It just says to love all brothers and sisters in Christ, and it just ends there. It doesn't say, love his child who votes like you. It doesn't say, love his child who agrees with you. It, say, it doesn't say, love his child who holds the same feelings about all the social unrest going on as you. It doesn't say, love his child who shares the same beliefs as COVID as you. No, it says, love his child, period. Just love him. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to be different in all the ways I just mentioned and more. But if we're going to claim to be born of God, then an unconditional love for all of his wonderfully different children should totally define that birth. Period. Speaking of a birth, totally defining who a person is, Rachel and I's son, RJ, we'll begin with the younger one. RJ, if you don't know him, is the most mellow, laid-back, reserved kid ever, okay, ever. He doesn't like going out, <laughs> neither do I, right? I'm kind of like him. He doesn't like big crowds and overly adventurous activities. New people and new things stresses him out, okay? That's just how he is. So he is perfectly, and I mean perfectly content, staying at home, quietly building his giant marble run, as I'll show you in the next photo. There he is. He can do that for hours. You'll forget he's there. Okay? RJ, peace, quiet. The lockdown was a joy for him. I mean, honestly. <laughs> okay? Now, here's the deal. I know he's introverted now, but I've always known he's be introverted like this. I always knew an introverted lifestyle like this would totally define him the minute we found out how he was going to be born. You see, on April 7th, 2016, Rachel, my wife, was 37 and a half weeks pregnant with RJ. And we were at a routine checkup with Rachel's doctor, so we're really close to the end. And everything was looking great. Everything was looking normal, right? And so after the checkup, the doctor, as she's taking off her gloves, like nonchalantly, not even like even looking at us, nonchalantly says, RJ's ready to be born, so do you want to give birth today? Like, just normal. And we're like, uh, 
sure, we'll cancel our reservations for tonight at dinner. We'll go. We'll do that. So he said, sure, why not? And the doctor says, three, four-minute walk from the hospital to cross the walkway. So we went into the hospital. We checked Rachel in. We called each and every family, had a conversation with them. They had plenty of time to come down. Rachel was induced, and then on a perfectly sunny 72-degree spring afternoon, RJ was born. Laid-back birth that defines a very laid-back boy. Let's continue to read what should be defining anyone who claims to be born of God. Verse 2. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. I don't know about you, but when I read this, I found the order here to be quite interesting. Notice John is saying, we know we love our brothers and sisters in Christ because we love God. Doesn't that strictly on the surface sound kind of out of order? Shouldn't he be saying that we know we love God because we love our brothers and sisters? Especially that's kind of what he's been saying the last couple of chapters. This is the book of love. John uses the word love 37 times in 105 verses, all right? And every single time before this, he's saying, he's saying, we love God because we love our brothers and sisters. But here it's backwards. Why? What's the deal here? Here's what I believe John is getting at. In this section specifically, John is zeroing in on what should define those who claim to be born of God. When we are born of God, okay, when we are born of God, when we voluntarily, voluntarily give our lives to Christ because we want to, who are we unconditionally loving to the best of our ability right away? Who are we loving right away? We're loving God, right? He saved us. We accept him. He died for us. We love him, right? We want him in our hearts and lives, and we love him. As much as a love for God defines that we were born of God, it's almost a given. At the very end of the day, if we've decided on our own free will to be born of God, then it's too difficult, at least not a lot of the time, to love him. It shouldn't be difficult a lot of the time to love him. Think about when you first gave your life to Christ, that new believer high that they call. It's easy to but what can be very difficult to do as a Christian? Loving his family. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. John is saying here, claim to be born of God because you love God? Great. What's not to love, right? Especially if you chose to give your life to him. Now, you're to completely define that birth, carrying out what can be a very difficult command, to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I can imagine the first readers of this and us sitting here today thinking, well, that's hard to do. <laughs> the command to love others, that can really be a burden. And you know what? John knew he would say that. John knew he would say that it was going to be a burden. So check out the very next thing he wrote on the next slide, verse 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, which are not burdensome. John is saying, Love for God, defining your claim of being born in him, is keeping his command of unconditionally loving all your brothers and sisters in Christ, and it shouldn't be burdensome. Now you may be thinking, not burdensome? Have you seen some of my brothers and sisters in Christ? <laughs> How is that possible? Have you seen what they post on Facebook? How is that possible? John's glad you asked. He's glad you asked, okay? The very next thing he says on the next slide is this. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. If we've truly been born of God, if we've truly been born of God, then carrying out an essential defining characteristic of that birth, such as unconditional all our brothers and sisters, will not be burdensome. It will be a joy, and it will be a delight. Not because it's easy to do, but because those truly born of God will have access to the power to overcome anything this world throws at us in order to not love others. Don't you feel like the world is shoving down our throats? Hate those who are different than you. 
Turn on the news for 12 seconds. But John is saying here, if you're truly born of God, then the power to overcome that world, the power to overcome those lies, will be granted to you so that you can love your brothers and sisters who are different than you. Is it easy? No. But can we do it? Absolutely. With this power. We can overcome that evil and that hatred and love others. That word overcome. <laughs> if there was ever a word to describe the birth story of our older child, Emma, it would be that word. Rachel's already nodding her head. As already explained, our younger son, RJ, is laid back, an introverted homebody whose idea of an exciting Friday night is quietly playing with his marble run, right? But Emma, oh, Emma. You know her? You see her running around here? She is a fierce, headstrong extrovert whose favorite thing to say is, so where are we going today? Okay? She needs to go somewhere, and she needs to do something always. All right? She is always down to overcome any challenge. For example, she's seen several pictures of Rachel and I snorkeling in the ocean with all kinds of sea creatures. So what does our adventurous five-year-old want to do? She wants to do the same. She's five. So we bought her her own snorkeling kit, and as you can see on the next slide, we took her snorkeling in La Jolla. She's five years old, and she went snorkeling. She was by far the youngest kid out there, by far, fearlessly snorkeling around schools of striped surf perch and opaline, Garibaldi, and there were maybe two dozen sea lions swimming 75 yards to her left. She didn't even care. She wanted to swim toward them, okay? Fearless out there doing her thing. Mama, let go of my arm. I want to swim, okay? Maybe it's the ocean. We're going to hold your arm, okay? But I knew, I knew that's how she was going to be the day she decided, I'm laughing, to come into this world. Her birth totally defined her personality. On February 28th, 2015, Rachel was 34 and a half weeks pregnant with Emma, and we had spent the entire day moving, moving out of apartments, bigger cons, more family friendly, right? And so we spent the entire day moving, and then when everything, with everything, still in boxes, and the moving truck still outside, Rachel and I collapsed exhausted until our mattress on the floor, because we hadn't even put our bed frame together yet, and fell right to sleep, all right? It was our mattress, our pajamas, and our disgusting moving clothes was the only thing unpacked that day, and we fell right to sleep take care of it in the morning. Oh, Emma. A few hours later at 4 a.m., Rachel wakes up with some serious contractions. Five minutes apart, barely. Emma was coming now. Her contractions are five minutes apart. Emma is five and a half weeks early. It's four in the morning, and our hospital is 46 miles away from our new house. We thought we knew when she was coming. We would make the trip and have plenty of time. No, that's not what Emma's plans were. So we stumble into our car. Rachel's not wearing shoes because we can't get them on her, right? And we're wearing the only clothes that were unpacked, our disgusting, sweaty, dirty, moving clothes that we had a few hours earlier. That's all we had. We hop into the car. I'm driving miles an hour up the 405 freeway. Okay, I'm not going to convict myself in church right here. And way too fast. Rachel is in the passenger seat writhing. As we're keeping track of the contractions, going down from five minutes apart to four minutes apart to three minutes apart, and we're still flying up the freeway trying to get to the hospital. We finally get off the freeway. I run a red light or two or seven, and we finally pull into the parking lot, okay? We park the car. Rachel stumbles out barefoot. We walk across the parking lot somehow. We get her checked in, and I'm telling you, not long after that, Emma came into the world. My parents thought we were prank calling them. Mom, Dad, Emma's coming. Oh, come on. You're waking me up. No, seriously. Like, no one believed it. <laughs> and we barely made it there on time. Talk about overcoming. From the moment she was born to today, overcoming has defined Emma. And you know what? It can define us Christ followers, too. Verse 5, next slide. Who is it?
that overcomes the world. Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Earlier, verse 4 told us that everyone who lives a life their claim that they've been born of God has the power to overcome anything this world throws at us and to not of others. But how can we access that power? How can we overcome all the differences between us and them? How can we overcome the animosity that the world tells us we need to have against those who aren't like us? How can we tap into and have our lives defined by the power that will enable us to unconditionally love others? How do we do that? It says it right here. By believing that Jesus is the Son of God. In verse 1, John told us that anyone who claims to be born of God is defined by their belief that Jesus is the Christ, right? The anointed one. Well, here, John bookends that thought by saying who claims to be born of God and wants to tap into the power of overcoming this world also needs to be defined by the belief that Jesus is the Son of God. So what does that mean? What does that phrase mean? It means that we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of the one and only God. To which you might say, yeah, Joe, that's Christianity 101. I believe that. You're kind of preaching to the choir here. And you know, by thinking that, you're right. You wouldn't be wrong in thinking that. Because James, in chapter 2 of his book, is saying the same exact thing when he wrote, you believe that there's one God? Good for you. But he ends that thought with a very sobering truth when he says, anyone know what he says at the end of that verse? Even the demons believe that and shudder. You see, to just believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of the one and only God isn't enough. By doing just that, we aren't doing any more than the demons. And we certainly aren't going to be able to tap into the power of overcoming the evils of this world. No. If we want to tap into that power, if we want it to define us, then we don't merely believe that Jesus is God. We believe in Jesus, the Son of God. We commit to him, and we entrust our very lives to him, having complete confidence that Jesus, the Son of God, will provide us with his supernatural power to successfully overcome every evil of this world so that we can advance his kingdom and love all others the way he loved us first. That's what it means to overcome the world. Do we believe in the Son of God? Are, is our lives defined by him? Because if it is, then we can love all those people. We can go against what the world tells us to do and love them the way God commanded us to because he loved us first. And how did he love us first? By coming to earth, by living a perfect life, by dying on the cross for our sins and raising from the grave. And this morning we have a chance to remember and reflect on his sacrifice for us through the partaking of communion with the bread representing his body broken and the juice representing his blood shed on the cross. So when the worship starts, as you feel led, please make your way to either communion table in the back where you can grab a free package of communion bread and juice and take it back to your seats to partake. And as a reminder, when you head to grab communion, you can also drop off your tithes and offerings in the kiosk locating near those tables. And one last thing, if you have questions about what it means to be a Christ follower or about baptism or about anchoring down here and making LMC your church home or about the men's and women's studies coming up, any question at all, you want to get on that texting list, anything, please come see us after the service at the welcome table right outside. Would you pray with me now as we bless this time of communion and worship? Dear Father, thank you for coming to earth, for living a perfect life, for dying on the cross for our sin, and for raising from the grave. May our lives always define our birth into you when we accepted you into our hearts and lives. Give us the strength to overcome this world and do what you have commanded of us, which is to love you and to love all others unconditionally. We pray you bless this time of communion and worship. May it bring you glory. 
Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is coming. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Joy, all 
all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And I will sing how great, how great is our God. And age to age, he stands. Time is in his hands, beginning and the end. know this one. You don't need to see the words. Here, follow me. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul. good God we serve, how great you are, dear God. Thank you, dear Lord, for your message today, Lord God. May you send us out, Lord God, with the ability to draw upon your strength, to draw upon your word that tells us we can love each and everyone, Lord God, unconditionally, Lord God, no matter what's going around around us, Lord God. Greater is he who is in me than who is in the world. 
Go before us, Lord God. Thank you once again. We love you. And we pray all these beautiful things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And we all said, God bless you guys. Have a great week.